This is the gentleman from Michigan Rise. Madam Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 6672, the Pandemic and All Hazardous Preparedness Reauthorization Act of 2012. Clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 6672, a bill to reauthorize certain programs under the Public Health Service Act and the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act with respect to public health security and all hazards preparedness and response and for other purposes. So into the rule, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Rogers, and the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, each will control 20 minutes. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and insert extraneous materials in the record on H.R. 6672. Uh, Madam Speaker, I would yield myself such time as I might consume. Gentlemen, it's recognized. Thank you. Although it has been more than 10 years since September 11th and the anthrax attacks that followed, the threat of bioterrorism remains a very real danger to the American people. Fortunately, we have spent the last decade preparing for chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats. By developing and stockpiling numerous medical countermeasures to protect Americans in the event of such an attack. As a result of these efforts, we now have numerous vaccines and treatments in the strategic national stockpile that will save thousands of lives if we are attacked. However, the work to protect Americans against bioterrorism is not finished, and we must pass this bill or the future of Americans' public health preparedness infrastructure will be in jeopardy. The Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Reauthorization Act, so known as PAPRA, is a fiscally responsible bill that represents common ground between the bipartisan House and Senate passed preparedness bills. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the bipartisan co-sponsors, including Chairman Upton and Ranking Member Waxman, as well as our great bipartisan partners in the Senate for their support in what has been a very productive process to ensure the health preparedness of our states and hospitals for the next flu outbreak or pandemic. The bill will reauthorize critically important biodefense programs designed to promote the continued development of medical countermeasures against threats that would strengthen the nation's public health preparedness infrastructure. Reauthorizing these programs is essential uh, to how the nation would respond to a chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear attack. PAPRA would reauthorize programs for five years at the fiscal year 2012 appropriated level. The bill would not create a new program nor increase the authorization for appropriations for the existing program. H.R. 6672 would reauthorize and improve certain provisions of Project BioShield and PAPRA, and its passage, I think, is important for the future of our national security here at home. And with that, uh, Madam Speaker, I would uh, reserve the balance of gentleman my time. Gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield myself time that I may consume. Madam Speaker, I rise in strong support of the Pandemic All Hazards Preparedness Reauthorization Act, which will reauthorize certain provisions of the Project BioShield Act of 2004 and Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act of 2006. This legislation was originally passed by Congress to help the U.S. develop medical counter uh, measures against chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear terrorism agents to provide a mechanism for federal acquisition of these newly development, developing countermeasures. Our nation remains vulnerable to these threats because many of these vaccines and medicines that are needed to protect our citizens do not exist. Developing and stockpiling these medical counterme uh, countermeasures requires time, resources, and research, all of which will be provided under the legislation before us today. I'm pleased that the language I supported during the committee process was included aimed at increasing emphasis on regionalized trauma care systems. This bill is also important to me because the University of Texas Medical Branch Galveston National Lab is in my backyard. The Galveston National Lab is the only BSL-4 lab located on a university campus. At the lab, scientists conduct research to develop therapies, vaccines, and diagnostic tests for natural uh, naturally occurring emerging diseases such as SARS, avian influenza, as well as for mi microbes that may be employed by terrorists. This is exactly the type of research we hope to encourage under the pandemic and all hazards preparedness reauthorization act. As original co-sponsor of the bill with Mr. Rogers, I'm 
very pleased to have how quickly we moved this rare bipartisan piece of legislation. I want to thank Mr. Rogers, Chairman Upton, Ranking Member Waxman, Ranking Member Pallone, Ms. Myrick, Ms. Eshoo, and Mr. Markey for their work on H.R. 672. And I strongly urge my colleagues to vote yes on this legislation. I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves the balance of his time. Gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would yield two minutes to the distinguished chairman uh, and great leader of this uh, Congress, Chairman of uh, the Energy and Commerce Committee, Mr. Upton from Michigan. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I particularly want to thank Mr. Rogers, who has helped shepherd this bill through our committee. And I know Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Waxman and Pallone, I appreciate their very hard work along with all of the members of our committee to get this bill done and to the floor this afternoon. Madam Speaker, this bill, the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Reauthorization Act of 2012, would reauthorize programs to design to encourage the development of medical countermeasures and improve the nation's health infrastructure to help us respond to a terrorist attack. This bill is very similar to H.R. 2405, the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Reauthorization Act of 2011, which passed the House last year. This bill, H.R. 6672, reflects common ground reached between the House and Senate through months and months of negotiations, bipartisan. And I'm hopeful that the Congress, the House, and the Senate will enact the bill this week so that we can ensure that our nation is prepared for the unthinkable. This bill reauthorizes the Special Reserve Fund, the Biodefense Advanced Research and Development Authority, and Public Health Preparedness Programs while eliminating duplicative reports. It also clarifies that the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response is the leader of the federal government's efforts on preparedness and response. This clarification will help in removing duplication, improving coordination, and providing accountability. The bill also takes important steps to foster medical countermeasure development by ensuring that the FDA's regulation of medical countermeasures are predictable, consistent, and in fact transparent. Finally, the bill would provide additional flexibility for emergency distribution, stockpiling use of medical countermeasures so the nation is prepared for whatever may happen. I would urge all of my colleagues to support the, the bill. And again, I, support, I uh, commend the Republicans and the Democrats for working together on a bill that really does need to get to the President's desk. And I yield back my balance of my time. Gentleman's time uh, has expired. Gentleman from New Jersey. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to yield now to the gentlewoman uh, from California some time, such time as she may uh, uh, need and um, uh, stress her involvement in this issue over the years. The gentlewoman from California is recognized for I such thank the time. gentleman. And, uh, Madam Speaker, it's good to see you in the chair. We're all going to miss you a great, great deal. Uh, I rise today in support of the pandemic, uh, all hazards, preparedness uh, acts, uh, uh, reauthorization. Uh, legislation I first introduced in 2006 uh, with Congressman Mike Rogers uh, to better help our country prepare for a chemical, biological, radiological, uh, radiological or nuclear attack. Uh, developing and stockpiling appropriate countermeasures is essential for public safety. And these programs encourage American companies to invest in areas of critical need, of high critical need. Uh, the bill before us today includes new provisions uh, that highlight the important needs of our nation's children. Children are not just little adults. They need special care and special medical attention. They're especially vulnerable to biological or chemical agents because of their size, their limited capacity to flush out toxins, their underdeveloped motor skills, and their total reliance on their parents or other caregivers. While the hope is that we will never need to use these countermeasures to combat an attack on our country, I'm proud that we've strengthened these programs for everyone in our country, especially the children. I'm pleased to see the Pandemic All Hazards Preparedness Act voted on today. I thank everyone uh, that's been involved in this on a bipartisan basis in the spirit in which it was first introduced when we introduced it in 2006. Uh, and I look forward to seeing it signed into law by the President of the United States. And with that, I will uh, reserve the balance of time. General, gentlewoman yields back. 
um, gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and just want to say thank you and congratulate my friend Anna Eshu for the work that she's done on this bill in such a bipartisan way, and I think we would not have advanced to this degree without her great help and assistance. And with that, I'll yield three minutes to Dr. Burgess of Texas. The is recognized. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Um, I also want to start by thanking uh, our chairman, Except Chairman me. Upton, Mr. Waxman, the ranking member, Mr. Rogers, as well as our staff, Clay Alsbach, and of the majority staff for their help in assuring that this bill, H.R. 6672, come to the floor. In an emergency, we need all hands on deck. In the aftermath of an, an attack, a natural disaster, or a pandemic, we need to be assured that there's an adequate supply of countermeasures to meet our nation's medical needs. This program has also proven itself effective and deserves to be reauthorized and strengthened as this bill does. Our nation will never reach the surge capacity it needs without utilizing all personnel in our healthcare workforce. The committee has worked with me to ensure maximum capacity by correcting an oversight in the original law and now clarifies that dentists and dental facilities have the opportunity to be included in the first responder framework by incorporating earlier legislation H.R. 570. Dentists are willing and trained to support the medical and public health response to a disaster, and this legislation allows states the option of incorporating dentists into their disaster response framework. In addition, the legislation expands on a long-held priority for me in strengthening our nation's commitment to trauma care and its continued necessity in the aftermath of a disaster. We're fortunate to have the bill on the floor today to ensure that National Disaster Response Framework has the maximum available resources and urge the Senate to take up this legislation. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from New Jersey. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman's recognized. I'm pleased to rise in support of H.R. 6672, the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Reauthorization Act of 2012. This bill reflects bipartisan work that has taken place between the House and Senate over the last several months to resolve differences between House and Senate-passed PAPA reauthorization bills. We all know very well that our nation continues to face threats that require an ongoing commitment to public health and emergency preparedness. Just recently, we experienced a devastating storm along the East Coast, Hurricane Sandy, that destroyed entire communities in coastal New Jersey and New York, including areas within my district. The federal government's support, including through programs authorized by PAPA, was critical in the wake of this disaster. The legislation before us today reauthorizes programs and activities first established as part of the Public Health Security and Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response Act of 2002, the 2004 Project BioShield Act, and the 2006 Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness. In the wake of 9-11, Congress placed a high priority on biodefense. Congress first passed the Public Health Security and Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response Act of 2002 to improve the nation's ability to respond to acts of biological terrorism. In 2004, we passed the Project BioShield Act with tremendous bipartisan support, and Democrats and Republicans worked together to authorize the development, procurement, and emergency use of medical countermeasures for biological, chemical, radiological, and nuclear threats. We then identified some shortfalls and in 2006 worked to amend and build upon the existing BioShield program and Department of Health and Human Services authorities by passing PAPA. For example, PAPA charged the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response with the department's public health and medical response. It required a national health security strategy to guide the department's preparedness and response efforts, reauthorize grants to improve state and local public health and hospital preparedness, and establish the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority to spur development of medical countermeasures. Together, BioShield and PAPA represent more comprehensive efforts to prepare for and respond to public health emergencies, whether they're naturally occurring events like the H1N1 outbreak or those that are deliberate, such as anthrax attacks. Now, as a result of these bills and the investments that followed, our nation is better equipped to respond to public health emergencies. I'd just like to take a few moments, Madam Speaker, to highlight ways that H.R. 6672 will continue the progress we've made over the past decade. First, the bill further facilitates the development of medical countermeasures 
through emphasizing medical countermeasures advancement in the national health security strategy, requiring the development of a five-year budget analysis of the countermeasure enterprise, and calling for the development of a countermeasure strategy and implementation plan. Second, Madam Speaker, H.R. 6692 bolsters the nation's medical and public health preparedness and response infrastructure, including through a new authority that would allow states to redeploy personnel funded through federal programs to the areas within their state where they're most needed in the aftermath of a disaster. Third, it strengthens and clarifies the position of Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response as the lead for HHS on emergency preparedness and response and calls for streamlining and better coordinating HHS preparedness grants with those of other departments. Next, it places even greater emphasis on the special needs of pediatric and other at-risk populations in preparing for and responding to public health emergencies. And finally, H.R. 6692 improves FDA's emergency response capabilities. It will enable FDA to authorize the distribution and use of medical countermeasures in preparation for an emergency and to take actions during an emergency that will allow for the most effective use of medical countermeasures. I'd like to thank Congressman Mike Rogers, Congressman Gene Green, and their staff who authorized the original House legislation, H.R. 2405. I'd like to recognize the contributions of Chairman Upton, Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Waxman, Congresswoman Eshoo, and Congressman Markey and their staff in strengthening the legislation as it moved through the committee process and in discussions with the Senate. They've all worked in a bipartisan fashion over the past year and a half to accomplish the goals of our members and should be commended for their work. And I also urge members to join me in supporting passage of H.R. 6672, and I'm hopeful that our Senate colleagues will similarly support this bill's passage so we can get the bill to the President's desk. Madam Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. <clears throat> Gentleman reserves the balance of his time. Gentleman from Michigan. Uh, Madam Speaker, at this time we have no further speakers and would continue to reserve the balance of my Gentleman time. Gentleman reserves the balance of his time. Gentleman from New Jersey. Uh, Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to submit letters of support from the following organizations into the record. Uh, the Alliance for Biosecurity, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Biotechnology Industry Organization, or BIO, the Roundtable on Critical Care Policy, and the joint letter from four public health organizations. Those are the American Public Health Association, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, the National Association of County and City Health Officials, and the Trust for America's Health. And I, I reserve uh, the balance of my time. Without objection. Does the gentleman from Michigan continue to reserve? Uh, Madam Speaker, I continue to reserve. Gentleman from New Jersey. I, I have no additional uh, speakers, and so I would just urge passage of the legislation and yield back the balance gentleman of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There's many things that keep me awake at night as the chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. The growing threat from chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear uh, attacks not only abroad but here is of growing concern. Instability in governments that possess these materials uh, and increasing interest from those who would uh, choose to do harm to the United States desire to get their hands on these materials means that we must prepare ourselves here at home for the unfortunate, uh, I think unlikely, certainly in the short term, but possible uh, uh, position of being attacked with these uh, disturbing weapon systems and this is that important step to protect Americans by increasing our stockpiles and would urge its passage. And with that, uh, Madam Speaker, I would yield back the balance. Yields the back. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill H.R. 6672? Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds uh, being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. Gentleman from Michigan. Madam Speaker, with that, I would request the yeas and yeas nays. Yeas and nays are requested. All those in favor of taking this vote by the yeas and nays will rise and remain standing until counted. Sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this motion will be postponed.
the gentleman from Pennsylvania seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass S. 1440, the Premi Reauthorization Act, as amended. The clerk will report the title of the bill. Senate 1440, an act to reduce preterm labor and delivery and the risk of pregnancy-related deaths and complications due to pregnancy and to reduce infant mortality caused by prematurity. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts, and the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania. I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days which to revise and extend their remarks and insert extraneous materials in the record on S-1440. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, S-1440, the Prematurity Research Expansion and Education for Mothers who Deliver Infants Early, Reauthorization, or the Premi Reauthorization Act, would take important steps to protect and improve children's health. The bill includes three important programs, the Premi Reauthorization Act, the National Pediatric Research Network, and the Children's Hospital's Graduate Medical Education Reauthorization. The Premi Reauthorization Act <clears throat> addresses one of the leading causes of neonatal death and a major cause of childhood disabilities, preterm birth. Since its passage in 2006, the Premi Act has sponsored important research that has led to improved prevention and care for children born too early. Reauthorization will mean the continuation of the program that will lead to even better outcomes for children. The National Pediatric Research Network is a proven way to support pediatric research by coordinating multi-centered research activities, including those in rural areas. By working in teams, innovative research improves especially for diseases that are rare or affect a small population of children. Most of the approximately 7,000 rare diseases are pediatric and often genetic, and doctors do not have sufficient therapies to treat them. This bill will help alleviate that problem. The G Children's Hospital Graduate Medical Education Reauthorization would enable the Department of Health and Human Services to provide funding to freestanding children hospitals to support the training of pediatrician and other res residents. Prior to the enactment of CHGME, the number of residents in children's hospitals had declined by 13 percent. Now the program has enabled children's hospitals to increase their training programs by 35 percent. In my home state of Pennsylvania, three premier children's hospitals, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, St. Christopher Hospital for Children, and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia receive CH GME funds that support and ensure world-renowned health care for children. CHGME is a significant achievement in pediatric health care in Pennsylvania and across the country. Despite these gains, shortages still exist, and the future of the pediatric workforce relies on the continuation of CHGME. I commend the leadership on both sides of the aisle and in the committee for their leadership on this. These programs enjoy bipartisan support and I urge my colleagues to support S 1440 and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves the balance of his time. Gentleman from New Jersey. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I uh, yield myself such time as I may consume. Recognized. Madam Speaker, I am pleased to rise in support of S 1440 as amended. The legislation before us extends two existing programs and creates one new initiative, all activities that impact children's health. The first title of the legislation reauthorized the Prematurity Research Expansion and Education for Mothers Who Deliver Infants Early, or PREMI Act, through fiscal year 2017. The PREMI Act was signed into law in 2006, and I was proud to be a co-sponsor of the original House legislation. S. 1440, as amended, calls for further studies on factors related to prematurity, improved data on the national burden of preterm birth, K-12 
continued preterm birth prevention efforts, and strengthen public and health provider education on risk factors for preterm delivery and treatments and outcomes for preterm infants. The legislation also codifies an advisory committee to the Secretary of Health and Human Services on infant mortality and directs the Secretary to coordinate existing quality studies on hospital readmissions and preterm infants. Since the enactment of the PREMI Act, we've seen the preterm birth rate decline to its present level of just under 12 percent, the lowest rate we've ever seen since the late 90s. The good news is there's been progress in better understanding the causes of premature births and promoting interventions that work. On the other hand, however, we still don't know the causes of premature birth in up to 40 percent of cases. And then there's the cost of the health care system of premature births, more than $26 billion each year, not to mention the increased risk of serious disability and death for newborns and the tremendous toll prematurity takes on their families. And that's precisely why the goals of the PREMI Act remain just as salient as they were six years ago. The second title is similar to the House passed National Pediatric Research Network Act of 2012 and allows the National Institutes of Health to establish a national pediatric research network comprised of up to eight pediatric research consortia or groups of collaborating institutions. The consortia will conduct basic clinical, behavioral, and translational research on pediatric diseases and conditions. Among the eight consortia, the NIH director will ensure that an appropriate number of awards go to consortia that focus primarily on pediatric rare diseases, such as spinal muscular atrophy or birth defects, such as Down syndrome. There are many rare pediatric diseases, and in some of these diseases, the children are incredibly fragile. If we can allow for research to occur across the country, not just one single location, research can be done at a larger level because children could then participate without having to travel. Additionally, we all know too well that traditionally pediatric research has been underfunded. That can make it hard to train and develop the research talent needed to address these devastating illnesses. The consortia can therefore be the training grounds for future researchers helping to fill the pediatric pipeline. And finally, the third title, Madam Speaker, of the amendment to S1440 reauthorizes the Children's Health, I should say, the Children's Hospitals Graduate Medical Education, or CHGME, program through fiscal year 2017. The legislation maintains the current authorization level and will support the work of 56 children's hospitals, training over 5,000 pediatric residents in 30 states. The CHGME program was first established in 1999, following declines in pediatric training programs that threatened the stability of the pediatric workforce. Like any parent knows, it's important to have a trusted health provider to turn to when your child is sick or is hurt. In Congress, on a bipartisan basis, recognized that if we didn't create and fund programs to train pediatricians, there wouldn't be anyone left to care for our kids. Since its inception, the CHGME program has been a success story, supporting children's hospitals and their work to train future generations of our pediatric workforce, including pediatric subspecialists in very short supply. Representing only 1% of all hospitals, the small number of children's hospitals that participate in their program train approximately 40% of all pediatricians and nearly half of all pediatric specialists. And that's why continuing this critical program will have a major impact on access to primary care and specialty care for kids. Reauthorizing this program, Madam Speaker, was one of my top health priorities of the year. And I want to thank Chairman Joe Piss, the chairman of our health subcommittee, for working with me on this bill. Together with his help and leadership, we were able to move this bill through our committee and to the House floor last year. And I'm hopeful that reauthorization of CHGME program uh, will finally make it to the President's desk as part of S1440. I just want to take a moment to commend Chairman Upton, Chairman Pitts, and Ranking Member Waxman for their leadership on this legislation. I have to recognize and thank the House sponsor of the PREMI Act and the National Pediatric Research Network Act, and those are Energy and Commerce members Congressman Eshoo, Congressman Lance, Congresswoman Capps, and Congresswoman McMorris Rogers. They were really dedicated to these important issues. Uh, Madam Speaker, I, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves the balance of his time. Gentleman from Pennsylvania. Madam Speaker, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Georgia, one of the leaders on this issue, Dr. Phil Gingrey. General, gentleman from Georgia is recognized for two minutes. Madam Speaker, thank you, and I thank the chairman for yielding. Uh, the gentleman from New Jersey just gave the attributions to so many members uh, both Republicans and Democrats from the Energy and Commerce Committee that worked so long and hard 
uh, on this legislation back originally in 2006 and now in the reauthorization of S-1440, uh, the Premi Act. Uh, a lot of statistics uh, that, that some people may not be aware of. Uh, one is the fact that about two-thirds of all infant deaths in the first year of life are among the preterm infants. Uh, and in 2008, 12.3% of all live births, over 500,000 babies were born preterm. Madam Speaker, let me put it a little bit in context. Pre prematurity or preterm birth is by definition a birth uh, earlier than 37 weeks. Uh, those children are usually not the problem. Uh, they're not the ones that end up with permanent disabilities, but there's a, a, a subset of prematurity, maybe sometimes referred to as immaturity, children that are born uh, as early as 20 weeks uh, all the way up to 37 weeks. And those children are the ones that very often, if they survive, are left with permanent long-term disabilities. We see a lot of folks on the hill that coming down the halls of our office buildings and, and sometimes they're in wheelchairs, sometimes they're visually impaired, uh, sometimes they're hearing impaired. But so many of those adults and children that we see on Capitol Hill were born prematurely. So a, a piece of legislation like this is hugely important. I'll end my, my remarks by just uh, making it a little personal. Uh, uh, my wife, Billy, and I, Madam Speaker, have 13 grandchildren, and the oldest will be 15 years old uh, in about three weeks. And they were born at 26 weeks. They each weighed one pound, 12 ounces. And thank God they are uh, virtually unimpaired today uh, and in the eighth grade and doing well. But, you know, this, it, it tugs at your heartstrings. Uh, this is something that's hugely important. The graduate medical education piece if I could have another 30 seconds, Mr. Chairman. You know, 30 seconds. Uh, and I thank the chairman. The graduate medical education piece is very important because these children hospitals, uh, they see so many of these young kids. In fact, 50% or more of their patient population are Medicaid. Uh, and they need this funding uh, for uh, c uh, continuing medical education for residents, pediatric residents. So I'll, I'll just conclude with that and just say how proud I am to be uh, supportive of such a great piece of uh, legislation, and I yield back, Madam Speaker. Thank back you. the gentleman from New Jersey. Thank you, thank you Madam Speaker. I'd like to yield now uh, to the sponsor of the House Premi Act, the gentlewoman from uh, California, Ms. Eshoo, such time as she may consume. Gentlewoman from California is recognized. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, I'm very proud to rise in support of the Premi Act uh, legislation that I introduced with Congressman uh, Leonard Lance. Uh, he's been a terrific partner, not only on this legislation, but on other pieces of legislation uh, that we've moved through the Energy and Commerce Committee, and I salute him. Uh, this bill uh, will expand research, uh, education, and prevention of preterm birth. Uh, as the mother of two children, I know how precious the earliest part of life uh, is, and it's our responsibility to do everything we can to make sure that our little ones begin their lives with more than a fighting chance. Each year, uh, as was stated, uh, each year half a million babies are born prematurely in our country, and preterm birth is the leading cause of newborn mortality and the second leading cause of infant mortality. Babies born even a few weeks too early can require weeks to months of hospitalization after birth, and premature birth can sometimes lead uh, to developmental delays and disability later in life. In addition to the emotional and physical toll of prematurity, there are significant health care costs to families, to our medical systems, and our economy. A 2006 report, I don't think the House is in order, uh, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Gentlewoman is correct. The House will be in order. Will all members please take conversations off the floor? Thank you. Woman may proceed. Thank you. A 2006 report by the Institute of Medicine found the cost associated with preterm birth in the United States 
was $26.2 billion annually, or $51,600 per infant born preterm. These are staggering amounts of, uh, of dollars. And while employers, private insurers, and individuals bear about half of the costs of health care for these infants, 40% uh, is paid for by Medicaid. So it's in the best interests of healthy babies, hopeful families, and the budget of our country to decrease preterm births. The good news is our investment in uh, preventing prematurity is paying off. In 2006, I introduced and Congress passed the first ever comprehensive Premie Act, and prematurity rates have declined since then. So this is very good news. Uh, the even better news is, is that today we're reauthorizing this law, uh, which holds important programs will, which will build uh, upon the momentum of the original law and provide us with new tools and knowledge to improve the lives and health of America's mothers and children. Uh, the PREMI Act has been packaged with other important pediatric health bills. Uh, I thank the chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Pitts, the chairman of our full committee, um, uh, Mr. Upton, uh, uh, the uh, uh, ranking member of the full committee, as well as Mr. Pallone, and all of our colleagues. Uh, you know very well, Madam Speaker, that we come uh, to this place to do good things for our country, to strengthen our nation. How proud I am um, that, uh, that we are living up to that uh, in presenting uh, this bill here today. In closing, I would also like to uh, thank uh, Aaron Kazelneck uh, Wise of my staff, who has worked on this bill as if it were um, the most important thing she could do in her life understanding that it is one of the most important things she could do in her life uh, for children in our country, uh, to the American Academy of Pediatricians who have been so magnificent in instructing all of us in our work on this legislation, and a particular shout out uh, to Dr. Phil Pizzo, uh, the Dean of the Stanford uh, School of Medicine, uh, a pediatrician himself who at one time came from the, uh, worked at uh, with great distinction at uh, the National Institutes of Health. Uh, so with that, I will uh, yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Gentlewoman yields back. Gentleman from Pennsylvania. Madam Speaker, I yield two and a half minutes. Gentleman from Michigan, the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Upton. Gentleman from Michigan is recognized for two and a half minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I, too, want to commend the Republicans and Democrats who worked very, very hard to get this legislation to the floor and, and hopefully to the President's desk as soon as we can, uh, particularly uh, Chairman Pitts and Ranking Member Pallone, uh, Leonard Lance, uh, and Eshoo has been uh, Lois Capps, uh, and the staff, really, on both sides. Uh, I made a commitment to, to all these members early on that we would work very diligently to get this legislation here, and we are finally here. Uh, Madam Speaker, this bill, S. 1440, known as the Premie Reauthorization Act, is designed to strengthen health care for kids, particularly vulnerable kids. Not only does the bill reauthorize the Premie Act, it also includes the reauthorization of the Children's Hospital Graduate Medical Education Program, and it authorized the National Pediatric Research Network. You know, the original Premie Act that I sponsored uh, brought attention to the problems related to preterm birth. And since its passage, the preterm birth rate has declined. Good news. But despite that improvement, according to the CDC, still a half a million babies are born prematurely every year in this country. That's one out of eight. We can and we must do better. This reauthorization will continue and strengthen the ongoing effort to track, prevent, and treat prematurity, ensuring that every child has a healthy start and a better chance at a healthy and productive future. Madam Speaker, the National Pediatric Research Network brings us a step closer to providing more help to the kids with unmet health needs, particularly those with rare pediatric and genetic diseases. I've met a number of times with a family in my district, the Kennedys, whose wonderful little daughters, Brielle and Brooke, who are affectionately known in our office as Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella, they have a rare disease called spinal muscular atrophy. 
and it's often difficult to conduct research into these diseases due to the very small number of kids with that disease. But today, we're working to provide families like the Kennedys and so many others with greater hope for a cure or advancement in the treatment. This bill will help establish pediatric research networks in the consortia that are effective in overcoming gaps in research. Networks and consortia will be comprised of leading institutions that act as partners to consolidate and coordinate those research efforts. With the passage of the Children's Hospital Graduate Med Medical Education in 1999, freestanding children's hospitals began receiving funds. 30 additional seconds? Freestanding children's hospitals began receiving funds to support their pediatric medical residency programs. And as a result, the number of pediatricians in the U.S. has grown steadily. Today, over 40% of the pedi uh, pediatricians and pediatric specialists are trained in the 57 freestanding children's hospitals that receive this funding. Proven track record. We need to get it done. And again, I congratulate the members on the floor today for getting this bill uh, to hopefully to the president's desk before the year is out. Yield back the balance. <clears throat> Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from New Jersey. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to yield now to the gentlewoman from California, who's the Democratic sponsor of the House National Pediatric Research Network Act of 2012, which is the second title of the legislation before us. Ms. Capps. For how much time does the gentleman uh, Such yield? time as she may consume. Gentlewoman's recognized. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I do want to also acknowledge you being in the chair as my partner in the Emerson Capps lectures and my na neighbor and a, a real friend. Mr. S Madam Speaker, I rise in strong support of the Premier Reauthorization Act. This is an important bill to improve the health outcomes of pregnant women and their babies, and it shows our nation's commitment to address the costly and emotionally troubling incident of pre term birth. And while this is enough reason to, for me to support this legislation, I'd like to highlight two additional sections of the bill that will improve the health and well-being not only of newborns, but of our children as they grow. First, it includes reauthorization of the Children's Hospital Graduate Medical Education Program. This is a critical investment in both the health of our kids and in the health of our economy by bringing new, talented individuals into the healthcare workforce. My years as a school nurse, I know the difficulty that children, especially those with special needs, health care needs, experience when they look for a pediatric specialist. And over the years, we have seen how CHGME programs have made a measurable impact in alleviating, alleviating that burden, allowing these children and their families to focus on healing. I'm proud to be an original co-sponsor of this legislation and will continue to champion it in the House. And while we must ensure that the providers are available for our kids, we are still far behind on too many important diagnostics, cures, and treatments for many of our ailing children. And that is why this bill also includes the National Pediatric Research Network Act, a bill that I co-authored with my colleague, Representative Kathy Morris McMorris Rogers. This legislation will help strengthen and coordinate our nation's research on pediatric diseases. It will disseminate research findings quickly so that all children may benefit, especially those who have rare diseases. And it will expand the geographic scope of research, giving sick kids easier access to research programs and clinical trials. Moreover, this bill places an added emphasis on researching children's rare diseases, like spinal muscular atrophy, as my colleague Mr. Upton has, has noted, and to develop new treatments to fight them. The low prevalence of these diseases makes them particularly hard to research, and yet these diseases have such a marked impact on the lives of far too many of families and communities, like the Strong family of Santa Barbara. My constituents, Bill and Victoria Strong, have worked tirelessly on behalf of their daughter, Gwendolyn, and all children with spinal muscular atrophy and other rare diseases. The work they've done to help raise the profile of pediatric rare disease research is going to help families all across the nation. I thank them, and I thank you. I also wanted to thank the leadership of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Chairman Upton, Ranking Member Waxman, Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Pallone for their dedication to this bill and to the staff, especially to Ruth Katz, for working across the aisle and across that Capitol to bring a strong bill now to the floor. I urge my colleagues to support this bipartisan bill. I urge swift passage in the Senate so that we can improve the health and well-being of all infants 
and all children. And I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. Gentleman from Pennsylvania. Madam Speaker, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Lance, leader on this issue. Gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for two minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and it's uh, wonderful to see you in the chair, and I congratulate you on your magnificent service to the people of Missouri and the nation. I rise in strong support of S-1440 uh, to reauthorize the 2006 Premi Act and provide important continued research, education, and intervention in the national effort to reduce preterm births. Madam Speaker, our nation's premature birth rate is one of the highest in the world and is the leading cause of newborn death in the United States. Infants born just a few weeks too soon can face serious health challenges and are at risk for lifelong health and learning disabilities. In addition to its human toll, premature birth costs our economy billions of dollars per year. And while the medical community has made great strides in identifying the risk factors associated with premature births, far too many premature births today have no known cause. That is why the members of the House and Senate have worked in a bipartisan and bicameral fashion to reauthorize the 2006 Premi Act so that we may continue to spur innovative solutions that will ultimately lead not just to healthier babies but lower annual health care costs. I thank Chairman Upton and Chairman Pitts and Ranking Member Waxman and Ranking Member Pallone for their steadfast leadership on this issue as well as Senators Lamar Alexander and Michael Bennett. Once again, I commend Congresswoman Anna Eshoo of California for working on an important issue to the health and well-being of the American people. While many complain about the partisan nature of Congress, we have worked in a cooperative fashion on this and other issues, as has the entire Energy and Commerce Committee. And it is in that bipartisan spirit that I ask all of my colleagues to join with us in support of the Premi Act reauthorization bill so that we as a nation will be able to continue our focus on premature birth research and prevention. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from New Jersey. I have no additional uh, speakers, uh, Madam Speaker. So if you don't, then uh, I would simply um, ask that uh, we support this legislation and pass it on a bipartisan basis, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Madam Pennsylvania. Madam Speaker, I have no further speakers. I urge support for this bipartisan legislation and yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass Senate 1440 as amended? Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds of being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table, and without objection, the title is amended.